In the summer of 2003, I began filming the series Atheism, A Rough History of Disbelief. As part of the process, I talked to a number of writers, scientists, historians, and philosophers. Having secured their cooperation, I was very embarrassed to find that a large proportion of what went on ended up on the cutting room floor, simply because the series would have lasted 24 hours otherwise. Well, as it happens, the BBC agreed with me that the conversations were too interesting to be junked. And with these six supplementary programmes, they've made the extremely unusual decision to go back to the original material and to broadcast at length some of the conversations which I had. Conversations with people such as the English biologist Richard Dawkins, the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, the Cambridge theologian Dennis Turner, the American playwright Arthur Miller, the English philosopher Colin McGinn, and the American Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. Now, the Nobel Prize-winning American physicist, Steven Weinberg, has often addressed himself to what he sees as the pernicious effects of religion. And when I met him in Texas, I started by asking him how he reacted to the fact that the physicists, who were his own intellectual predecessors, had seen the physical regularity of the universe and the beauty of the Earth to be incontrovertible evidence of divine design. Looking at nature uh, in the past, the impression of design must have been overwhelming. I mean, it's such a comfortable, pleasant earth, and things work out so well. Uh, well, as we learn more and more about the universe, it seems uh, not such a friendly place, and we appear just to have been winners in a cosmic lottery. And yet there might be those um, believers who might say, yes, admittedly, there are other uh, celestial bodies which are not good stage sets for life, let alone for the human drama, but here we are on Earth, which is, as they would say, convivially arranged to, uh, to accommodate Well, life. What, what would you expect? I mean, with all these billions and billions of planets, some of them are going to be comfortable. And it's only on those that life can arise. But um, people like Newton, for example, and uh, Samuel Clarke, who wrote, as it were, on his behalf later on in, at Trinity when he did the Boyle Lectures, um, was not invoking the, the comfort and, con and conviviality of the earth. Uh, Newton was impressed by the regularity of nature. Whether or not it was a suitable setting for the human drama, he thought that the laws of motion and the arrangement of the, uh, of the, of the celestial system um, expressed design regardless of its suitability for human existence. Yes, and, uh, well, he was religious. Mm. He saw the universe as a great puzzle just as he saw the book of Daniel as a great puzzle. And it was God leaving messages for human beings to puzzle out. And he puzzled out the way the solar system worked, and he tried to puzzle out the chronology of the Bible. Uh, well, we don't do that anymore. But might there be any reason, and in fact you still find people, and indeed some of your own colleagues, um, who feel that nevertheless, the regularity, um, by definition, involves and invokes uh, a regulator. Well, it, it doesn't... There is a mystery, I have to admit. Uh, you know, we try to understand nature and we ask questions and we get answers and then we ask more follow-up questions. Well, why is that true? And uh, we, ultimately, we hope to come to some set of elegant physical principles that describe everything. And when we have it, the mystery will still be there because we'll always have to ask, why is it that theory and not some other theory? And one answer is, well, that is the regularity imposed on it by a spirit, a designer. But it, that doesn't answer anything. I mean, then you have to say, well, why is the designer like that? You know, either by a designer you have something in particular in mind um, a god who is 
benevolent or jealous or humorous, mm. <laughs> whatever, or you have nothing in mind. If you have nothing in mind, let's not talk about it. And if you have something in mind, then the question arises, well, why is, is that true? So I don't see that having a designer puts us at rest. I think we're permanently in the tragic position of being able, not, of not being able to understand at the deepest possible level why things are the way they are. And um, we'll just have to live with that. But saying, well, it's a designer doesn't, doesn't settle it, doesn't help. But let's say, and I'm being, as it were, the deist's advocate here, uh, or... Uh, instead of the devil's instead advocate. Instead of the devil's advocate. Um, let's say that it doesn't exhibit, or it doesn't answer the question of design, but if there is this um, insuperable mystery, um, might one understand how it is that people feel that in the presence of such a mystery, that... Uh, they, as it were, it's the thin end of, of some sort of theological wedge into which spirituality or an originator can be inserted. Oh, I, I mean, I don't feel that. I, I, I don't feel that way either. I suppose many do. I think much more likely is that people are religious because they're, they know they're going to die and they know their loved ones are going to die. And that's the tragedy. It's not that that bothers them. It's not the tragedy of not being able to come to the final cause. It's the tragedy of knowing that your life and all the wonderful things that you can do and living and the people you love, that that's all going to end. Uh, it seems to me that provides the driving force for religion much more than these philosophical wonderings about first cause. These issues of the beginning of time were discussed very intelligently long ago by Augustine, and uh, who grappled with the question of what there was before time began. And uh, he said, God created the world with time, that uh, time was created. There was no before, that that's part of the creation. Um, that's as good an answer as any, I guess. But it is interesting that someone like Augustine, without the benefits of, of, of quantum physics, without the benefits of Einstein, without the benefits of any of your sort of work, was able to invoke ideas such as time itself having a beginning. Yes. Well, Augustine was a very clever man, and uh, it's wonderful, looking back over all the thousands of years of speculation about these things that time I think first with Galileo became part of the ordinary um, ambit of science. I mean, Galileo was the first person who tried to measure time uh, during a physical process, measured the time it took for various balls to roll down an inclined plane and he got the rule that the distance traveled is proportional to the square of the time Nobody before had ever tried to bring time into the laws of nature quantitatively. Um, but for Galileo, observing these regularities and observing the, uh, the, the relationship between uh, these balls rolling down slopes, the time it took, mm. and giving a mathematical expression for that, for him, uh, as an unquestioningly religious man, they were, in fact, demonstrations of God's mind. Well, I don't think Galileo came to that conclusion. I'm not, if he did, I'm not aware of it. But the, if what you're suggesting is that uh, there is no necessary conflict between being a scientist and being religious, I, I suppose I have to agree. There, even now, there are very fine scientists who are deeply religious. I know a few. Mm -hmm. um, but the, I think what happened, and it only began to happen with Galileo and Newton, so it took a long time to mature. What happened was that much of the early uh, basis for religious belief was dissolved by science. It wasn't that scientific discoveries made religion impossible. It, it's that they made irreligion possible. Mm. It became possible to understand how things worked 
without the religious explanation. And particularly, uh, I think more important than anything any physicist did was what Darwin did, Darwin and Wallace. Yes, well, this is the, uh, the argument which we've had, uh, I think, I think from Dennett, from Daniel Dennett. He feels that perhaps the most wounding uh, influence upon religion really came with Darwin rather than with Galileo. Oh, and, I agree, and, uh, I agree. Uh, even though it hurts my pride as a physicist to say so, uh, you know, because people don't really care that much about the way the planets go around the sun or, uh, or the way, the, certainly they don't care about the balls rolling down the inclined plane. What they care about is life, and particularly their own life, and their relationship to uh, the causes for them being the way they are. They care about that. Um, and Darwin's revision of the, uh, argue, of the understanding of why living things are the way they are, in particular why people are the way they are, was overwhelming, and Darwin himself lost his faith. Uh, you know, I, I was recently rereading uh, Lytton Strachey's wonderful little biography of Cardinal Manning mm. in Eminent Victorians, and Manning said that he was con he became convinced, a, a convinced Christian, because of reading uh, Paley's Natural Theology. Yeah. Yes, and and. The wonderful uh, adaptation of living things uh, convinced him that there had to be a creator, a, a person, a personality that created all this. And suddenly that was gone. There wasn't a discovery that there wasn't a creator, but the, the argument was removed. And I don't think anything in, that science has done for general culture has ever been as important as that. Yes, it is interesting to find that, on the whole, the, the percentage of biological disbelievers in the scientific community is higher than the percentage of disbelievers amongst your colleagues in physics well, and chemistry. Is that true? I didn't know that. Uh, actually, I've occasionally, not too often, gotten into conversations with my physicist colleagues about religion. I find an overwhelming lack of interest in it. Uh, I once said that they don't care enough about it to qualify as practicing atheists. They, um, they just regard it as a sort of question that it's silly to raise. And um, I, I, for some obscure reason, I, I tend to care about it. Uh, and I'm interested in religion. But uh, most of my physicist friends are not. Um, but you find such a variety of beliefs. I, I have one f friend, a very distinguished astrophysicist, who told, told me that he's an orthodox observant Jew, which is a lot of trouble. You know, that's not easy, and doesn't believe in God. Um, because for him, the religion is a um, framework for life that he inherited from his parents. He grew up with it. He wants to stay in it. Um, but he doesn't think there's anything behind it. Uh, I, I think probably a fair number of people in the Church of England feel that way. I think for a number of people, the retreat into religion is, as you say, um, not a retreat into belief, but a retreat into reassuring domestic ritual. And I suspect that that's much greater for Jews than it is for Christians. I mean, there is a, a way in which one could say that belief is less important for Jews than observance. I think that's very true. Uh, one could argue about the reasons for it, but I don't think Judaism is the only religion for which that's true. I think it's also true for Hinduism. Um, I don't think the Hindus have ever looked very closely into what they all believe. They, they're allowed to believe in all sorts of things, but the important thing is, you know, the Brahmins are not supposed to cross the, the ocean and uh, you're not supposed to kill cows. Those are, that's what's important. What, you know, what you really think about Brahma and Vishnu and Shiva, I don't think you, there was ever an inquisition in, uh, in, among the Hindus.